The What's Neat This Week video podcast is supported by enthusiastic model railroaders just like you. Additional support is provided by Athern Trains. Check out all their new monthly announcements at athern.com. And by Intermountain Railway Company, where the detail makes the difference. Check out their website at intermountain-railway.com. The National Model Railroad Association, where membership has its benefits. Check out their website at nmra.org. Further support is provided by Microengineering, keeping you on track with quality products for 55 years. Check out their website at www.microengineering.com. Order from your local dealer or order direct by calling 1-800-462-6975. Additional support is provided by TCS, Train Control Systems. Check out their high quality DCC sound decoders, throttles, accessories, and more at tcsdcc.com. Further support is provided by the NCE Corporation the power of DCC. Visit their website at ncedcc.com. And thank you for supporting the What's Neat This Week podcast. This is the What's Neat This Week show number 120 for June 20th. 2020. How about that? All those 20s, guys. Tonight, we've got a great group of guys on Skype, and Daniel couldn't get Skype to work, so we've got Daniel in the studio with us. Don't but, worry, I'm wearing a mask. We're six feet apart. And I took his temperature. He's, he's totally <laughs> normal. I've got on Skype in the upper corner here, Dan Michio from Train Control Systems. Hello, Dan. Hey, Ken. Also, on the right next to me here, I've got James Regeer. Hello, James. Hi, everyone. And down in the bottom corner, I have Mike Buddy. Hello, Mike. Hey, everybody. It's great to have all you guys here. Um, it's really weird having only three folks on Skype, but here's Daniel in person, of course. Did I introduce you? I've got Daniel Coombs. Yeah, you already did. Okay, rock and roll. Got that <laughs> covered. I've been working a lot on the Garden Railroad. You know, that's an ongoing project that I've promised to try to get done for What's Neat videos this year, whereas I've got to pour 23 feet and nine inches of cement on this curved area of the Garden Railroad. I finally pulled up all the bricks. I burnt all the vegetation so I've got clear earth so I can see what it is surface-wise that I have to work with. The area has actually settled about six inches, which requires me now to bring in some more dirt and refill a little bit more before I go about pouring the cement, which I'm thinking I'm going to just have float on top of the ground, maybe only four inches deep, whereby I can avoid any issues with frost heave. Our frost line in the state of Missouri is about 36 inches deep, and I just don't see the need to dig that far if you figure it, because it's a built up hill, and when you come into it from sideways, it will almost defeat the purpose. I literally would have to dig down seven feet to defeat the hill itself. So I don't think frost heave is gonna be an issue, and if it is, with cement, it's generally easy on a rainy day just to push things back down into place. It hasn't been a problem. Our biggest problem in Missouri are moles. And when they, and if you don't Oof. have a cement ro roadbed, moles really do tend mm, to destroy yeah. Garden Railroad uh, ballast and the right of way. Right. I also plan on doing some work on that deck out there. I've got to power wash that and get that area all treated with some new green. But albeit, I will say that if anybody ever decides out there to build a Garden Railroad, be prepared for a railroad that requires constant maintenance, just like the prototype. But on the other hand, there's nothing better for entertaining friends, Daniel. It's fun yeah, when you've got true. folks out there. Mm -hmm. It's really great well, to have you in Ken, the studio. Go ahead, James. Well, Ken, you have convinced me that uh, a garden rail railroad is great to enjoy at someone else. No, absolutely. It's like, a, like a swimming pool. <laughs> Wow, James, you're breaking up just a little bit, James, which reminds me of the live stream show that I did with Kevin Rubel. What's the name of that show, Daniel? OS Virtual Check-In. OS Virtual Check-In. Go ahead and turn your sound down just a little bit so I don't get that feedback. Very good. So anyway, on this show, I tell you what, we had a new router installed in the house within four hours of doing that show, and I absolutely apologize to the viewers out there that I dropped off a couple of times and my, my sound was quite um, broken up. 
So now what we've done down here is we don't require on routers anymore. Everything is hardwired, so we will have no problems with our signals coming through Skype and in the event that I ever have to do a show for somebody else out there via the internet, I think that really is going to solve the problem. The NMRA last week, Jerry Leone did a fantastic job. I really wanted to thank him so much for what he did with regards to sharing his home layout and talking about all of the aspects and the members membership that benefits. Uh, that the NMRA has to offer. <clears throat> there are a lot of things, the partnership program, that insurance was a really special thing that I wanted to talk about tonight because the insurance is something that covers uh, your models, your personal models, um, the liability in the event that you guys are set up at a train show and things like that. You can find out more information about the insurance that the NMRA offers on their website at nmra.org. O-R-G, nmra.org. Um, it's quite amazing all of the things that they offer, the standards, the uh, magazine, the calendar that comes out every year, the shows, and all the local shows. It's, it's a great way to share the hobby with a lot of friends. At this point, they've got 17,000 members worldwide that belong to the NMRA. And I, again, I want to thank very much Jerry Leone for doing a great job last week. And next month, we will have other individuals on the show talking about some of the other benefits of the NMRA, some of the more complicated things that actually I don't know about. You know, the layout design SIGs is another great aspect of the NMRA. And there's a lot of information about that that I don't know about, but we're all going to learn it together. So without further ado, let me uh, go out to Dan Michio out there. Dan, how's things going out there at TCS? You're really close to Bachman out there in Philadelphia, aren't you? That's right, yeah. Uh, we actually just had them up not too long ago uh, for the next OEM project we're doing, them, uh, doing with them, which is the uh, Charger, the SC44, uh, coming to the end of that. Um, so yeah, things have been good here in PA. Uh, we've been staying safe, staying healthy, uh, and uh, we're doing what we can to keep the business. Uh, we're doing what we can to keep the business going. Now you're 24 and, uh, years young, yeah. and you sent us some pictures of an absolutely beautiful layout that you have. You model in N scale, is that right? Yeah, that's right. I like the cute scales. <laughs> I like uh, N. I like Z. Uh, I I inherited that layout that I got from uh, my old scout troop that I was in. And uh, it was a, it was kind of like a barn find. We, we had a, a location that we met in and we were rooting through some of the old stuff in, in one of the sheds and there was this layout there. It was face down on, its, on the track work. And so I wound up having to replace about a third of the track that's on there. Um, but uh, my scout leader said, hey, you're here, you can have it. And uh, I've been working on it for a couple of years on and off here and there. And uh, I just converted it over to DCC finally. <laughs> Is that right? All right. Yeah. I'm going to ask. Yeah, yeah. I noticed in one of the photos you sent me, you still had the two uh, dual control or dual throttles. Yeah, yeah. I had one of the, the dual, dual power packs. Um, it, I can still use them. I can still take them in and out. You would also notice I have the Atlas selector switches for the different blocks that I have. Right. So on DCC, what I actually do is on the A and the B, I have the lead swap. So I can do my reversing loops without having had, actually having to use an auto reverser or anything like that. So it was a really nice way to be able to reuse that. How about that? Mm. What kind of a system are you using on that layout? So I, I borrowed one of uh, our NCE power cabs that we had here. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I'm still waiting for our command station, really. That's when I'm going to finally do the conversion, when I'm going to start putting in uh, block detection, uh, maybe a signal system, and maybe I'll take out the Atlas switches in favor of some actual auto reversers and uh, switch throws. That sounds fantastic. Michael Buddy dug out his caboose out in Lakewood, Colorado gift card which uh, I purchased for a lot of the guys about, uh, what was it, almost a year ago. About a year and a half ago. And I think we're going to use yeah. a portion of the proceeds from that gift card uh, with Kevin Rubel and, and Chris out there and get you that uh, power cab system, uh, Mike. Sounds good. That's the same system that Dan is using here uh, at TCS, so I think you're going to find it enjoyable. Not to mention all the sound and all the features of your locomotives you'll be able to use that you haven't been able to use previously. So, And I've been using the, the uh, NCE power system, like I say, all week this week, but something different this week. I've been using the smaller uh, 
portable cab, which I really like, the smaller cab, because, it, I mean, the big one's ergonomic, the big one feels good, but I just love just holding this in one hand and using the pentiometer round throttle knob on it that it has. The larger throttle's got a thumb wheel and a press button. Your option, you can use either one for making the train go faster and slower. But this just feels old school to me to use a potentiometer. Mm -hmm. And I really like that. So thank you very much, NCE, for creating a system that works good for everybody's taste. I love that. Dan, you also um, work with the prototype. And that involves your job, too. Why don't you talk about that a little bit and how much fun it is getting out there in the world and getting sound files for your decoders. Yeah, it's it's one of the best jobs in the world. <laughs> um, definitely. It, it's really fun to be able to get out uh, with, with the company and travel all over the United States and go and find and see these interesting locomotives and uh, be able to record them. It's always an adventure. Uh, you meet some really interesting people, really interesting operators that always have you know, hours and hours of stories to tell while you're out there recording. So you, you learn some really neat things and you have a fun time doing it. Uh, it's always been a dream of mine since I was a kid to clamber around on locomotives and now I get to do it and I get paid to do it. Uh, wow. <laughs> so it's just, it's, it's it really is cool. Yeah. I got photographs of you on number 620. What type of locomotive is that? 620, uh, that was a Norfolk and Western GP9 That's uh, that was at the North Carolina Transportation Museum. Uh, yeah. That was back in, I believe, 2019? No, 2018. Uh, we went out and did a recording there. We got three locomotives, and that was one of them. Very cool. It looks like you got S. Is this an S2 that I see here? Uh, you... uh, there was another shoot we were on a little bit more recently up in the Cooperstown and Charlotte Valley Railroad that's in New York State. And, uh, yeah, they had uh, Alcos, S2s, and S... Yeah, I believe they're all S2s. There that's, was three of them, and we recorded each one. That is such a cool thing. That's a, such a great job. Now, we uh, all... Daniel, myself, and uh, James Regeer have got your wonderful UWT-100 throttle. And last night, I learned how to make it so that it'll never turn off. You can program it so it'll shut down after 20 minutes to conserve on battery, but then my trains down here would stop running, and I like to run trains for hours and hours while I work. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to reprogram that so it would never turn off. And that was simple to do. I just went into settings and was able to scroll down until I got to that feature and change the uh, timing on it. But tell us about this and, you know, you said to me, you know, you had a lot to do with the design of this, and there's a lot of thought that went into this. Why don't you talk about that a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah, so I am the project lead, project manager on the command system. That includes the UWT-100. Uh, it's going to include the UWT-50, which is going to be uh, our, basically the analogous uh, system throttle to the, the, the mini one that you have there from NCE. Uh, it's going to be a similar design. And then also our command station. Um, so I've been heading up that project, working with some great folks. We're making good headway on it. And, uh, yeah, so there's been, you know, as, as the lead of the project, I can attest to how much time, how much deliberation has gone into every single aspect and uh, feature in the throttle. The design iteration process for the case, uh, several, several revisions. Um, we, were, we were experimenting with 3D prints, and we would test it and then uh, we'd make more changes. One of the things that you'll notice on the throttle is the recess around the thumb wheel, which gives you a really good uh, uh, ergonomic feel to it. And if you're somebody who has like uh, arthritis in your thumbs and whatnot, where you may not like the, uh, the thumb wheel on the NCE, for example, that extra recess in there allows you to get more grip on it and it makes it easier to turn as well. And that alone went through like five revisions, that recess. So. Mm. Uh, tons and tons of time, tons and tons of effort have gone into this with the hope of making this the most comfortable, the most user-friendly throttle that you're ever going to work with. No, it's awesome. Well, I'm, I'm so happy it does work with NCE. Go ahead, yeah. James. I really like the aspect, you know, I mean, just the, just the lanyard that, that it's designed to go just makes it so handy for one-handed operation that you can, or or no-handed operation, if you're needing to mess around with the track, you don't have to find a place to put your throttle. You can just let it dangle there for a little bit. You don't have to worry about dropping it because it's secure to your wrist. That's right. Uh, but there's just, yeah, 
that's that's one of the things that I've noticed that there's just so much that's gone into making this a pretty pleasant operating experience. Yeah, yeah. There's a, there's the other stuff under the hood that you don't see either that we've taken the time to think about. So like the menu structure, for example, uh, we tried to make everything as convenient and easy to access and easy to understand as you can. And with that large screen, it means that we can display a lot of information in a reasonably small space. So it means that we don't have to cut down the text and make you guess or have to look in the manual uh, to find certain options. And the other uh, really neat user experience and interface that you can use is the first 10 options on any of the menus uh, can be accessed using the buttons on the keypad. So if you're somebody who remembers where it is that you want to go in the throttle, you can just punch it in like a pin on on a keypad, and then you're right there. And it is, you know, you can change your settings, you can operate something. Um, so that uh, the pathing for that and where things are located and what they're called, uh, those are things we all took into consideration very heavily when we were designing it as well. No, it's fantastic. It automatically found my new router last night. I, 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 I'm just impressed with the menu itself, all of the different options on it. It's even got something on it where if you can read about how to use it, mm -hmm. if you're, I mean, the help That's button, right. the help button is wonderful. It's like made for me. I love the help button. <laughs> I just do. <laughs> I just got to get you away yep. from putting everything into address three and get you to advance consciousness these things, but I've tried. There's no reason to try to fix a broken wheel. I just like it the way it is. Um, but yeah, this oh, is but amazing. I tell you, the advanced consciousness on those, Dan, while you're mentioning it, I've just seen nothing better. Like, you don't have to worry about putting things into an advanced consciousness come out of advanced consciousness they don't work the next time because the address has changed that new advanced consciousness address. Um, the throttle leaves them at the address that that uh, you had them from factory or from your uh, from the settings that you programmed them to. Right. And it determines which locomotives get which, which command on which uh, which you tell the is your lead. So it's all done from the throttle out. It's a design on that yep. one. No, it's yeah, absolutely I'd love true. to do a segment on the show sometime all about consist thing if you'll have me back. <laughs> Dan, the magic well, of it. I'm sorry, go ahead. Um, Dan, hold on. Dan, the magic of it, and James Regeer pointed this out to us on another show, was that when, when James, all his engines aren't set to number three like mine are. He's actually got separate locomotive numbers for each one. So while James is setting up his consist, your throttle, you can tell it which one is the lead locomotive, and it'll automatically turn on the headlights on just that engine. You get the sound horn on just that engine. I mean, that is, that had to take some thinking, didn't it? Yeah, it definitely did. Uh, we like to call that feature cab control, uh, and it's completely controlled by the throttle. It's a part of the consisting system, and you can configure those options for what you would like to have function-wise sent to the locomotive that you have selected or to the consist as a whole. That's so awesome. you can think of it as us emulating in our system the control that you get from certain CVs on the decoder, and I, you know, you don't have to look it up for your particular manufacturer, what does what. And uh, it's completely transparent to you. You don't have to think about it. And it's not permanent, which is the other thing. You can apply these settings to any locomotive in your roster. You can make a consist out of any locomotives in your roster. And you can disband them at any time. It's, awesome. it's really a beautiful, elegant system that uh, makes consisting significantly easier than it has been in the past with some systems, I like to think. Good job, Dan. And for folks that uh, you can purchase this at your favorite hobby dealer, or tell us the website, Dan, that you would go to to purchase one of these throttles. Yeah, so if you head on over to tcsdcc.com, that's our website, and uh, you can look under the trackside devices on our main menu for the UWT100, and uh, you can also read up on the features of that and the command system as well. And that's the point of this show, is to let you know about new products and where to get them. I've got your track cleaner here, which I've had for some time. It's one of my favorites. I did a What's Neat video on it, and it's one of the most amazing track cleaners I've ever seen. Not only does it have a pad on it, but it's got a vacuum cleaner in it. I mean, it's just the top comes off and you're able to clean it out. There's multiple decoders in this. This is a very well thought out uh, model that you guys have had built with your partner, Korea Brass. And you guys also make locomotives. Tell us about that, Dan. 
Yeah, so uh, TCS is the official reseller, distributor, whatever you'd like to call us, of Korea Brass USA. Uh, and the website for Korea Brass is korea-brass-usa.com if you want to see the listing of products there. Um, but currently we do sell the track cleaning vehicles that you have there, and we also have the U25 Seeds. Uh, the U25 Seeds are available right now in four different roads. You have the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Burlington, uh, the Northern Pacific, and Conrail. Nice. Uh, we currently only have a limited number of each left in stock, and when they're gone, they're gone. But there is a possibility of a second run once the first run sells out with more roads. That's fantastic. So, now, when yeah, I had all, I had a set of those all, U23Bs here. Wow, sound is that correct? Hold oh, on. yes. Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing about these. Um, the Korea Brass vehicles that you have there, uh, the track cleaning vehicle has a non-sound dual-mode decoder, so it'll work on DC and DCC. That was designed by us at TCS. And all the U25Cs are uh, equipped with TCS's WOW sound as well. And uh, we have the recordings right off of a U25C that we found in California. I don't remember the name of the railroad off the top of my head. But uh, that sound file will come loaded onto your decoder when you get it. So you basically just take it out of the box and let it roll. No, that's cool, James. What I, what I was about to say was when I had those U25Bs and I featured them on What's Neat over at Mount Rio Hobbies Magazine, um, they talked to me. That's what impressed me the most was when I was programming those, the girl's voice coming out of the locomotive walks me through the steps of programming. Another well thought out product, Dan. Yeah, yeah, we call that feature Audio Assist. It's available on all of TCS's WOW sound decoders and has been since the first version uh, almost 10 years ago now at this point. Um, and Audio Assist is, like you said, it's an auditory feedback program that allows you to be able to program your locomotive without ever having to touch any CVs at all. Uh, it's all prompt-based. It works off of you using the buttons on your controller, and it works with any DCC system. That is cool. Very cool. Basically, you can think of it like an a automated phone service where you call in and you say, what would you like to do? Would you like to do a, option one, two, three, or four? And you pick what you want to do. And uh, it makes it really easy to be able to configure a locomotive very fast. Uh, if you get uh, some experience and some uh, time with the program, you can set up a locomotive from factory settings to as prototypical as you can make it in five minutes or less. That is way cool. On the table tonight, we've got those wonderful P42 locomotives from Athern Trains. And the reason I've got them on the table is this week, um, a photograph that I shot uh, for Athern is all of these locomotives lined up around a turntable. So it was really cool to see all the various Amtrak colors saluting their, their paint schemes right there as we look around at these photographs on this turntable pit diorama that I had built. Absolutely amazing. You can check these out at the Atherin website at atherintrains.com. The fact is they're going to be in the Genesis line, Genesis line for the very first time. And that's exciting because that means they're going to have all the features of LED lights, rubber hoses, Tsunami 2 sound. I believe this is the unit that I said had two different speakers in it. Am I right? The 28 millimeter speakers. That is correct. This is the first time that it's ever coming out of the ready to roll to the Genesis line, so congratulations on graduation P42s. We love you, they're gonna be great. Also on the table tonight, we've got some really wonderful, and you're gonna love this, Dan, N-scale models from Intermountain. I shot these outside today. These are Aeroflow coal gondolas in N-scale, and these are in the value line. So these are the, the more affordable ones that are just a little bit less detailed. But as you look at these photos, all the details are still there. The rivets, the interior bracing is in these cars, as you can see from the top photograph that I shot. And I also shot photographs of the ends. But individually, I've got uh, three different road names here. The first one is Canadian National, which I'm holding in my hand. You can see the outdoor photographs of that. The other one is Procore which is really nice. That's the one with the blue ends on it. No, that's the one with the yellow ends on it, isn't it? And the mm -hmm. ends signify which end of the coupler has the rotary coupler, so when they rotate these to dump these, that's really significant. And the last one that I've got is Luscar, otherwise reporting marks L-U-S-X, and that's got the blue ends on it. These cars are really wonderful as we're building the project layout in N-Scale. I look forward to watching these run on the layout. They come with metal wheels, and it appears they also have very small metal couplers on them. Those might be Katie couplers. 
really nice the way they're set up. Um, thank you very much, Intermountain, for sharing those brand new N-Scale um, Aeroflow coal gondolas with us on the show. So with that, let's go out to Michael Buddy. Mike, you sent us some beautiful photographs. What have you been working on, brother? Well, uh, you know how I like the uh, auto industry and the relationship to the railroads. So I've always been <laughs> kind of fascinated with uh, high cubes, the 86-foot cars that uh, you used to have all the railroad names and slogans on and everything. Now they're just pretty boring. Brown, Conrail, or NS. But uh, anyway, uh, back in the day, in the 70s and in in the early 80s, they were uh, still pretty colorful. And here's a few of the examples that I've done. Uh, the first couple are Frisco cars. The uh, first one is a Walters Pullman Standard car, number 9120. You can uh, always spot the Pullman Standard cars because the side posts stick out at the bottom uh, along the side so they come out from beneath the side sheets and then the second one 9140 that's an Atherton Greenville car and uh, I've got a close-up shot of around the doors how I, I tried to make it look like the warped panels that's the first time I had ever tried to uh, simulate the the warped panels so I got uh, had a little practice on that and put some scrapes on it and uh and then there's another wow. shot in there uh, between two cars, the end details of the grab irons. Um, that was one thing I always did on the Atherin cars was grind off those end grab irons that stuck out and, and replace them with wire parts because I thought that increased the, the realism a lot. And I used to put cut bars on all my cars, but they, they keep getting broken off when I take them to shows and friends' house and stuff. So I, I don't do that. On a, on a lot of models anymore but uh anyway the next few cars are from uh illinois there's a chicago and eastern illinois car that i used and i, I simulated the uh the white paint leaching down the sides with white colored pencil to uh make it look like the paint streaking down nice. and then there's an, another uh uh four-door car in illinois central orange car um that uh is real faded and weathered looking um actually i made the decals for that by by copying a decal sheet on a copy machine at work and i turned it down the uh black level down so it was kind of faded looking and uh decals turned out pretty nice for that so uh next couple are uh, uh two eight door cars two illinois central cars uh, a brown one and a uh, an orange one um then the last two are some uh, Pacific Car and Foundry high cubes that were outside braced. And the only uh, railroads that had them were Santa Fe and Southern Pacific or Cotton Belt. And uh, I made those two models by uh, gluing ribs over the weld seams on the Greenville uh, cars that, the, that Atherin made on both the uh, eight-door and four-door car versions. And... Um, then just painted around those, and uh, I, I painted that cotton belt by hand in that in that round circle, so it it, it looks okay, I guess. But uh, anyway, then the last thing I'm working on is uh, this this little truck here again. It's a, a 65 GMC B series cab. Nice. And uh, Greg Dixon is he molded it, but but I, I'm putting a different cab on it. I'm, uh, he had a, a 62 version with the dog leg a post here so i'm i replaced this whole cab and uh it'll look like that that red one that i that i posted pictures of so uh whenever i get that done i'll be sending that up to greg and then he'll be selling it so anyway that's pretty much what i've been working on one more thing i got this uh this brass uh vertipack here oh wow it's got one oh, door that opens on each side and uh i got a vega from john tyson so i've casted a bunch of vegas and i'm gonna do the inside of this car with all the vegas you know standing on their noses so that'll be something to look forward to that's gonna be a nice piece mike yes yeah, that yeah. Looks awesome. i've I, always I, really liked that uh, design when they when they did the car carriers like that back right. in the day where they would load them in and they'd be uh, right. Standing straight up. <laughs> right. That was a specialized uh, 
system that, that was a joint venture between General Motors and Southern Pacific to uh, do uh, ship that Vega. You know, it was the only car they ever did like that. And as soon as the Vegas went out of production after the 77 model year, they, they took those uh, Vertipacks off and turned the flat cars into conventional auto racks, I believe. So, but yeah, that was pretty unique. It's too bad the design didn't work out so well. You well, I, I understand that they had to actually redesign the cars so that right. they could handle standing up like that. Right. Yeah. They had uh, special like baffles in the uh, number one cylinder in the oil pan. Well, in the oil pan to keep the engine, the oil from going into the number one cylinder. Then they had like uh, like the windshield washer bottle was mounted <clears throat> at 45 degrees. So it would work, you know, either flat or, you know, nothing would leak out in the there were special plugs and stuff to keep the fluids from leaking, but it was generally designed for that. And uh, it's too too bad that the, that it has the reputation that it does. It you know, they rushed rushed those things. They were trying to pr uh, print them at 100 units per hour, and uh, that caused a whole bunch of problems. And so, right. But it was it was a very cool concept that was going on when I was in high school, and I just thought that was the coolest thing. I was that's all I was thinking about is auto racks and vertipax when I was in school. <laughs> right, right. You're awesome. No, Mike. I mean, it seems like an awesome enough idea. Yeah, yeah. Seems like they might be able to do it again nowadays because the cars are a lot smaller. But I think they're taller too, and uh, there was a limit to how high the car could be. You know, and be able to fold them up together without smashing them into each other. Right. So it was pretty, pretty cool engineering feat. Dan, you sent up some photographs of you standing as a very young man in front of number six eleven, a Norfolk and uh, Western uh, streamlined steam locomotive. And I've got another photograph of here of you as you were a little bit older of a gentleman. And it looks like you're studying the detail parts on it. And the reason I'm leading into those three photographs that I just showed you was because this week, Daniel got us some footage of a new locomotive that's coming back to our museum that used to be here a long time ago. And that is another NNS locomotive. Is that right? NW Norfolk and, and, Western. Norfolk and Western. Correct me on that. But tell us about that, Daniel. All right. So for those of you who have been following the 2156, which is the last of the two 882 Malay, uh, version of Norfolk and Western. It was on a five-year lease to the Virginia Museum of Transportation up in Roanoke. Um, and just last Saturday, there was a joint effort that the museums came to an agreement that we would get the Y6 back and then they get the uh, EMD Demonstrator B unit back. So I went down there Saturday, waited for about three hours. Crew UP came in, they backed into the yard. And you're probably seeing a little bit of clip right now of it backing into the yard and then the uh, NS and UP crews both pulled the B unit out and then off they went. So That's cool. So that's at the Museum of Transportation in St. Louis, Missouri, so that anybody wants to see that. And is that museum open now? Have they opened Yes, it? and coincidentally, last Saturday was their very first day open to the public. So nice. what are the odds of a new steam, well, steam engine coming back after five years and then that being the first day opening? Um, and there were a few other... Uh, not necessarily train buffs, but just some general people that were asking us what was going on. And uh, remember the one person asked me, hey, you got that railroad scanner? Is what's coming? I said, <laughs> a steam engine's coming back. They're like, how long is it going to be? I said, I don't know. You know, it's a railroad. You know, some things happen, but they work around it. That's so. awesome. Now, that model's available in HO scale from Lifelike, otherwise known as Wathers Trains. Is that right? Lifelike models? <coughs> that's the old Lifelike? Uh, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Walters had owns or bought out life like that's right. Mm -hmm. Right. Is, so, this, is this the one you're talking about? Um, yeah. Well, that's the J. That's the one we had pictures of Dan standing in front of. Well, yeah, okay. I have one of those. Is that the Bachman model? Or who, who, man, who so, makes that yeah. one, Mike? Spectrum. Yeah. It's Spectrum. This says I have two one of those as well, drivers. actually. Uh, I converted that over to TCS as well, sound as well. Oh, nice. And you guys are doing that. sounds for Bachman, aren't you? You guys, your TCS decoders come with Bachman, the higher quality models that they come out with, including that brand new Amtrak uh, Charger locomotive. Is that right? That's right. Yeah, I had mentioned that earlier. The SC44 Charger is the next project that we have coming up from Bachman. Very cool. uh, but we are we are doing the sounds for their Spectrum line as well. Uh, right now, the uh, currently available products that uh, they have with our sound in it is the uh, Spectrum K4, the streamlined model. Oh, nice. Uh, the 
ON30 trench engine. It's a 262. Uh, it was used during World War I. Uh, there's the newest release of the Russian Decapod. And uh, the next project coming up is the SC44 Charger from Siemens. Very cool. I can't yeah, wait to get my hands I, on that. I saw the uh, I saw some video of you guys doing the uh, sound recording from that. That was that was pretty awesome experience. Yeah, for sure. That was that was really cool. It's interesting to see how railroad technology and locomotive technology is continuing to move forward these days. Right. It's impressive. On the table tonight, we've also got this microengineering number five turnout. And as I promised you all last week, I painted this. I painted the ties with a can of Rust-Oleum Earth paint, which gives you that nice brownish tie color, which I then followed up with a little bit of weathering. But I've got close-up photography and video of me painting all of the hardware on these turnouts. And I painted them with a uh, flocal rust color, which is a little bit of a brighter shade of rust, which would exemplify all the various details of the hardwares on this. The bolts, the clamps that come up underneath and clamp the guardrails into place. There's just a lot of neat detail that microengineering builds into their model turnouts because track is a model too. And that's something that Dave Davis used to dwell into our heads as he used to show us weather track and things like that. It's amazing. If you guys have got good eyesight, the fact is it's great to see not only beautiful equipment running on the track, but then the track looking absolutely as fantastic as that. So check this out. You can find these on the microengineering website. They prefer that you call them to place the orders on phone or visit your hobby dealer because most dealers all stock microengineering products but I couldn't wait to share with you and yes it took me about an hour to paint this turnout last night mm. and um, just with a very very fine zero 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 paintbrush in order to paint all of the uh, tie plates the spikes and the other appropriate hardware that's on these turnouts so that was a cool project and the other thing that we said that we would discuss a little bit tonight and we're going to talk about it just briefly are trees I've got a few examples of trees and I'm creating a what's neat video this this month at Mono Road Hobbyist Magazine that will run in August, sharing all the different types of trees that are, that are available or that you can build yourself. Starting with, and I'll hand you this one, Daniel. Sure. These are wire trees. And wire trees are one of the best ways I've found for making trees. You can also you can cover them with flocking if you choose. They make great wintertime scenes. But the key is to come up with the out the structure that kind of covers up the wire a little bit. And to do that, I used I like to use this Rust-Oleum paint. It's kind of a flaky paint. It's called texture paint, and it comes out of a spray can. And you spray the brown color shades on this, and it creates a really nice bark effect. It usually takes between one hour and three hours to make a wire tree, and I usually copy them off of prototype photos in order to get the branch structure to look just right. The other type of tree I've got on the table is a sagebrush tree. What do I mean by that? Sagebrush is the main armature for this, and then I put over that various types of uh, netting. In this case, I'm using the Bachman poly fiber type of netting, and then you spray sprinkle ground foam on top of that and adhere everything with hairspray to it or Woodland Scenic Scenic Cement so it keeps it soft and it never comes off. And in order to clean a tree like that on your layout, I find it's easy either to vacuum them, which does work, and or just spray a new coating of hairspray on it and the uh, the the resins in the hairspray encapsulate the dust and literally make it go away. The third type of tree I've got here is a pine trees, you know, the old pole type pine trees. These are made from dowel rods and I simply push hog hair, which is a furnace filter material, on top of the tree and then flock it also with ground foam or you can follow it up with a static grass gun if you want to create the individual pine needles effect, which is what I've done on this second tree here. The pine needles really come out great because the uh, static grass sticks up, sticks straight out, and it looks very effective. Um, the last type of tree that I've got, I know you see another one here. This is your simple um, bottle brush tree like we saw Campbell Rice make, pulling a tree out of a hat, Campbell Rice. Yeah. <laughs> but these are the super trees. Right. You get these super trees from Scenic Express. And guys, do you know what this material is called? It's a natural growing plant. Um, and I don't remember what hmm. it's called, and I wish I did. Yeah. I don't remember either, but it looks really realistic. It does. You, you put flocking on those, or you don't have to. You spray the armature. I usually spray them with a brown paint, like, again, earth brown right. from Rust-Oleum, before I put on mm -hmm. the green flocking. But these things look really great, especially when you have a whole hill of them. And that's just five right. 
different ways to make trees. My favorite and most detailed, again, would be making wire armature trees. So that's our tree skit. I know that she seems short and sweet, but there's a lot of videos. And again, you can watch the What's Neat video coming out in August where I'll actually show you how to make probably the sagebrush trees is what I'll start with because those are the ones that I use primarily on my layout. And those are the signature trees that we used on the Midwest Valley Modelers layout that just made it look dynamite yeah. 20 years ago, Mike. Has it been, yep. it's, 1988 is when we started building that layout. That was a long time yeah. ago, brother. Yep. So that just about covers everything on my list. I'm going to go out again to James. James, your sound is breaking up a lot, but I know you're working on that track mobile. Every night you've been sending me pictures of it, and I'm sure you're going to send me pictures of the process that I saw last night. It actually looks like a deep sea submersible with all those lights lit up on it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, it's uh, it's finally... Uh... I guess, for lack of a better better phrase, um, it's there's finally light at the end of the tunnel, as it were, uh, on this project. Um, I've I've gone through it, and I I'll I'll send the pictures in be, rather than try and fumble with the wires right now to get everything lit. Um, but it's coming along as I want it to to do with the headlights and the tail lights, hazard flashers. Um, I have the programming uh, pretty much ready to go. Arduino, as you can see, you've got the double flashing strobes wow. that are slightly off time with with one another. Um, so that'll I have to obviously program this uh, Arduino down into a tiny Atmel AT a tiny thirteen chip, you know, about the size of uh, about the size of uh, this little uh, wire cap here, um, just because there's no way that the Arduino would fit into the Trackmobile. Right. It's much bigger than the Trackmobile, obviously. I was following that discussion on Facebook, James, with uh, when you were talking about that uh, trackmobile, and a couple guys actually chimed in that had driven trackmobiles. They, you know, that was what they had done for a living, yeah. and they were explaining the lights. You know, what they what the different lights were used for. I thought that was really interesting to yeah. learn about. Yeah. Well, right so. about about how the strobe light often, if they were not on the rail, often fold them away. Right. Right, on the road, um, just because these would be very tall uh, vehicles. Otherwise, um, very very large, uh, very large road vehicles, I suppose. But uh, right. on the right. on the tracks, they're absolutely tiny. <laughs> right, exactly. Wow. I love it every time I watch this show. I get an education from you guys. Daniel, it's awesome to have you here. Guys, have we pretty much covered everything? Is there any last minute things we need to talk about? Uh, if you want to talk about the pricing on the two vehicles, the TCB and the U25C, I have uh, sale prices for those. You do? Sale prices yeah. for the What's Neat viewers and everybody else out there. Go ahead and shoot. That's right. So uh, the MSRP on the track cleaning vehicles uh, is three twenty five ninety five, And right now for the What's Neat viewers, we have a sale. If you mention uh, the show. That'll knock you down to two forty nine ninety five. Wow, that's a lot. That's a lot. Now, do they have to call you on the phone, or how does that work? You can place an order online, uh, but you can also call us on the phone. Uh, calling in is probably the way to go. Give us your phone uh, number. But uh, you can also visit Korea Dash Brass Brass dot dash. Sorry, let me get that again. You can also <laughs> visit <laughs> Korea Dash Brass Dash. USA.com, and you can place an order through there as well. And what is there a paragraph yep. or a place where you can mention the show on the website? Yep, you can put it in the special order comments. Special yep. order comments, guys. How about that? That is a deal. Pretty cool. I know. Yeah. Or you can yeah. call your phone number, and what is your phone number? Uh, ooh, hang on. Let me lift that up. I don't actually know what that is. is, is I imagine <clears> it's a 1 800 number. I always give the micro engineering number for track. That's amazing. Here you are. You're on the computer. Um, James, what are you using to broadcast tonight? Are you using a laptop or your cell phone? I'm using a laptop, and I'm not sure why the uh, sound is, is a little bit wonky for me. That's okay. I apologize again to Kevin Rubel and the guys out there at Caboose. I didn't know why my sound was wonky either or why I cut off 12 times on that shell. I'm so sorry, guys, for doing that. We got a brand new router, like I said, Did installed. Did you broadcast something by mistake, too, the other day, Ken? Something um, went out by mistake? I've been experimenting. Like I've been experimenting <laughs> with a program on this laptop, and I pushed a button on there called Live Stream, not reeling. I had no idea that it would put it out onto YouTube, but it did. Um, 
And so I experimented with that again last night and Stripe was here walking around on the table and you know what, it had like 2,000 views and it was only a, <laughs> like just, it was just me down here messing around with a couple different cameras. I was doing some experiment with multi cameras. If there's anybody out there that knows the right type of program for doing a live stream where I can use multiple cameras, put it in our readers comments and let me Google it and look it up. I'm very interested in that and I'm gonna look up some YouTube videos this week to see what's out there and available so that we can actually do a live stream show with multiple cameras pick what camera angle we want, and also answer questions live. Because that's one of the benefits of doing that show with Kevin Rubel and Caboose out there in Lakewood, was it was so relaxed. It's not like this podcast where we've got all this different stuff that we need to cover, talk about, and make, I'm always looking at my list, right? It was so relaxing to not have any show notes, not have to worry about editing, and just simply answer questions. That was fun, in fact. Not that this isn't fun. I love you here, Danielle, this is fun. Thanks. But yeah, rock and roll. Okay, so go ahead and shoot us that phone number, Dan. Yeah, so uh, the phone number that you can use to call in for Korea Brass USA is 215-257-2535. Okay, and so that's the deal on a track cleaner. That's a special price. And what was the deal on you on the e-boats? Yeah, so the U25C, uh, yeah, U25C usually MSRPs for two ninety nine ninety five. Okay. But if you mention the What's Neat This Week show, you get it for two twenty four ninety five. Two twenty four. Those are going to sell out. Rock and uh, roll. And it is first come first serve, like I said before, uh, with what inventory is left. So if you want a particular road, the sooner you call in and get that order placed, the better before you run out. Best hobby in the world with the best people in it. Dan Michio out there in Philadelphia, thank you. Daniel Coombs sitting right next to me on the other side of the monitor. It's awesome to have you in the studio. Well, thank you for letting me come. Fourth of July, we're gonna do our very first show. We're gonna have everybody back again. Uh, we'll probably be all wearing masks like, like Daniel's doing tonight. James Regeer, thank you very much again for everything that you share with the show, all of your electronics, LEDs, and personality. And in the event that you don't get enough of James tonight, check out his What's Neat video currently running in the June, is it June right now? The June, June. video, where he okay. shows how to install LEDs, a new motor, weights, and everything else, customizing an Athern SD60M in the Santa GP60M. Fe. GP60M in the Santa Fe uh, war bonnet. God, I was on a roll. I was going to get that right. As a matter of fact, <laughs> it's with TCS Wild Sound. So. TCS Wild Sound in that one, too. And that's a great yeah. locomotive. Um, just a beautiful project. You did the whole video yourself for me. Thank you very much. 32 minutes of James Regeer showing what goes on inside of his shop. And of course, Mike, buddy, we love always hearing about your freight cars, your verdi packs, your box cars, and your automobiles. This is the What's uh, Neat. Thanks. What's Neat This Week, show number 120, created by model railroaders, just like us, just for you, sharing what's new in the hobby and everything else that we can do on a weekly basis. Just, it's the best hobby in the world with the best people in it, guys. So with that, let's go run some trains. How about it? Let's go run some trains. Thank <laughs> you.